بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, Today inshallah we're going to be talking about the Imam's professional skill set what trainings he can take what are some things that he can do to help complement his religious and his religious studies so that he can be a more effective Imam and I will talk about certain trainings that uh, I had personally available to me that are public and that are available to others um, so I, I hope nobody takes it to be me me showing off, at, you know, the skill set or the trainings that I've had. Again, these are something that are completely publicly available. And many times, if not most times, the communities are willing to pay for these trainings, which aren't particularly expensive. So it's very important, again, for us to understand the central theme of any discussion that we have in the central theme of the Imam professional skill set talk is understanding the position. I think this is something that's very critically important for us as a community and for the Imams themselves that if they understand the position, they will understand what trainings they need to help complement their skill set that they already have. So ritually, what does the Imam need to know uh, in terms of because he will be leading the people in prayer, he'll be there giving them fatwa, there will be a lot of religious counseling, uh, whether it be financially or otherwise, you know, what does he actually need to know? Uh, he has to have a basis, basic understanding of Islamic knowledge. And I think this is something that's very important. He himself doesn't need to be very well versed in all things because he can always network and reach out to people who can help give him answers. So I think it's it's very difficult for us to actually picture somebody walking up to an imam and imam not knowing the answer. I think what is more, more important is that the imam has the resources so that he can provide an answer for that person. Meaning that if somebody walks up to me and says, you know, Sheikh, what is the answer to this question? Or I have a 401k or I need to, or I need to take a loan or, you know, I'm traveling this distance. What actually constitutes travel and when I can start shortening, combining my prayers, etc. There are a number of issues that an imam will face with. Uh, many of them can generally be categorized into, you know, particular issues that an imam will face day to days, and then you will have uh, extenuating circumstances, obviously. But again, it's more important for the imam, uh, not necessarily to be well versed in all of these issues, but it is very important for him to have a good network so he can reach out to those people. So when somebody approaches him, instead of him saying, I don't know, uh, the best answer that he can give is, okay, let me consult with my peers and I'll get back to you. This way the person doesn't feel rejected. This way he doesn't feel like you know he's being ignored. And you take his number or you take his email and then you can sit down and you can actually contemplate what the issue is and you can get back to him as soon as possible. Again, I think this is something that is very important. And, and after a number of interactions in this way, the imam will be equipped himself to be able to answer many of these questions because like I said, they're usually a set standard of questions that he has to deal with with certain extenuating circumstances. But in general, what should an imam know? Uh, what are some of the things that he's going to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis? So when we talk about uh, one of the first sciences or the science of aqidah or belief, uh, he will have to deal with issues uh, concerning doubts with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, spiritual crises concerning the religion, how to actually answer many of those doubts. I think that's something that's very important. Uh, understanding iman and takfir. Uh, when is a person uh, excommunicated from Islam? When is he actually um, called a non-Muslim. When is this? In, 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 when is is this person outside of the fold of Islam? I think this is a very critical discussion, and I think it's something that a lot of people have a misunderstanding of, and how to actually deal with that issue. Um, something that we should actually be very well versed in. Uh, one of the best books I actually have on the subject is. I'm sorry, can you hand this? Up? It's the first, second book. I'm right next to it. Yep. Sorry about that. But uh, this is by one of my teachers, Sheikh Ahmed Sharif, which is called Takfir Ahl Shahadatain. I believe one of my friends is actually working on the translation for this book. I have uh, translated myself. His discussion on Ibadah, on worship, is something that's available, something that I believe is a must read for anybody who wants more depth, in depth understanding of the issue. And that's where this individual's understanding of the Quran, to what extent uh, should he know and what extent should he be able to give the tafsir of the Quran. Having a general understanding of the tafsir, understanding what the primary resources are, uh, how to make sure that we're going back to the classical resources and the classical tafsir, I think is something that's very important, something he should be aware to us. The other parts of Quran, which is not necessarily related to the Quran, 
specifically but is directly connected to it is, is ulum al-Quran and understanding how the Quran was transmitted to us. How is it that it reached us in the way, in the shape, in the form that it is today? I think this is something that is very critically important, something that is uh, currently being attacked and I think something that we need to be aware of as imams. A hadith. Uh, within the science of hadith, how it was, again, how it was transmitted to us. I think this is something that is vitally, critically important. A tadween is a very important science within the science of hadith that an imam needs to know how it was compiled, how was it written, how was it recorded. Um, hadith criticism, how did the classical critics of hadith, how is it that they actually approached it, how did they criticize it as a hadith. And lastly, the status of the companions. I would say, if anybody asks me what is the most important thing within the science of hadith, I would say it is these three. Uh, going and studying mustala, uh, teaching the people with certain particular terminologies. I mean, that's good, that's great. You know, obviously I don't have an issue with that. I don't have a problem with that. Myself, I also teach these things. But if someone said, okay, what are the three most important things a person needs in order to teach the common Muslim or the lay Muslim, I would say it is these three. Uh, studying uh, fiqh, fiqh, obviously important. It, I think it's important that Imam at least be versed in a particular madhab. Again, he doesn't need to be extensively versed in, in those, but he needs to at least have an idea of fiqh. <clears throat> how are the abwab organized? How, what are the categories of fiqh? Uh, how to deal with that? Where to look up an issue if he has to look up that issue and who to reach out to in, in case he has an issue which he himself is not clear in. Uh, understanding the differences of opinion, the nature of fatwa has very much changed because of the internet, because of access to the information. It is not enough now for someone to come up to me and say, what is the ruling on this? And I just tell them it's halal or I tell them it's haram. It's very important that I present all of the different rulings on that particular issue. Then I give my tarjih, then I give my, uh, my opinion on that, saying that this is the reason that I choose this opinion, but they need to be aware of all those because... Very honestly, if someone comes up to me or somebody comes up to you as an imam and they ask you, what is the hukum on this? What is the ruling on this particular issue? And you just tell him one ruling and he goes online and he's like, man, this imam doesn't know anything. There are like five other rulings concerning this issue. Why didn't he mention them to me? So again, it's it's not, we don't tell people to confuse them. We tell them to let them know that we are aware of those opinions, but we have taken this particular one for this particular reason. Uh, usul, I think it's important, again, when for an imam himself to understand maqas of the sharia, why is it that the Sharia was sent? And if he has a good base and a good understanding of that, all of those things, you know, what, what is a mujtahid and, you know, dirat al bad and all of these other sciences and usul. Again, these are very good. They're good for him to know. But what it is that he's going to be caring for, what it is that he's going to be teaching the people, I think maqasid is one of the most important sciences within that history. Something that's very critically important, something that's very much overlooked in, in many of our masajid, amongst many imams. We do not have a good grasp of our history. Islamically, and I think this is something that again is critical something that is very important It helps put the religion in context. How is it that all of these rulings were applied in different times in different places? Understanding what our scholarly tradition is this is something for us to take pride in uh, How to kind of put those things in perspective again? This is something that is very important Which leads us to the final question is can the imam be a muqallid in all of these sciences? Can he be a blind follower in whatever the science might be? Whatever information he has taken, can he just kind of stick within that framework? Absolutely. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't see an issue with that. But again, it's very important for him to network. If he recognizes that he himself is a muqallid, he is not in a position to make ishtihad. He's not in a position to make fatwa. And he should refer the people. He should act as a gateway to the people in order to refer them to specialists in those particular fields. Because he himself might espouse particular opinions or certain opinions but he is not allowed now to give fatwa in those particular opinions so again something that is very critical something very important to understand uh, what he can do as an imam is he can create workshops within the community that i think uh, again are something that are very important something that is very much overlooked it is very important for him to train 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 I, i'm going to emphasize this time and time again an imam not because he's lazy or you know i i am but, but not because he's lazy but he should try to delegate as much of his responsibilities as possible. And the best way to delegate that is by training the community, uh, whether it be Quran teachers. Again, it is not beneath me to teach kids Alif Bata. It is not beneath me to teach them and sit down and to read with them. But is that the best use of my time? The imam is giving me a salary. I mean, the community is giving me a salary. They're paying me for something. Is this what they're paying me for to teach the kids Alif Bata? You can call in a math professor from MIT, you know, to come and teach a kindergartners how to add or teach first graders how to add and subtract, is that the best use of his time? He could train five, six, seven people to do that job. And I think this is something that's very critical, something that is very much overlooked. 
that the imam should not be the crutch for the community. Meaning that once that crutch is removed, the community falls apart. No, they should be, be very much an independent entity and he needs to come and complement the services that are already being there. So socially, uh, this is something again, that is very important. Uh, something that we need to remember. I want to share a few of, again, the certifications that I receive very easily available. This is not something, again, that is unique to New Jersey or unique to where we are, but something that I want all of you to be aware of. Uh, mental health first aid. Uh, these guys are throughout the U.S. and they I know they offer these services everywhere. They provide certification. The certification is good for three years. Then it, it is renewable. Uh, the first one I want to share with you, and this is for adults. Is this within frame? Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is for adults. And this is the first one that I actually took. I think it's a wonderful opportunity. It's a wonderful chance. Uh, for anyone to take that and i suggest and i encourage everyone to take this it is not a way to diagnose different mental health issues but it is a way to identify them so identifying substance abuse identifying depression identifying anxiety uh, identifying a th psychosis this is something that is very important uh this this one is the, for the youth so basically how to identify those four things that i had spoken about for youth uh, they touch on something that youth suffer more in than adults, which is um, eating disorders. So again, it, this in addition to those four, it will help you identify the fifth, not diagnose. Again, I want to be very, very clear in that. It will help you identify so that you're able to refer people appropriately. Uh, these are two courses that I would highly recommend anybody take. It's They're usually a one-day course, um, and it's something that is very much um necessary for the imam in order to help him identify some of the problems that he will face in the community. Uh, the other set of issues that he will deal with is abuse and trauma. And in order to deal with abuse and trauma, I think it's very important for the imam to understand how to deal with abuse, how to deal with trauma, whether it be spiritual, whether it be physical, whether it be mental, whatever the situation might be. Uh, this is something I would recommend everyone to take part in. Also, within frame? Okay. Uh, this is something I would recommend everyone to take part in. These Peaceful Families Project, ha they do this uh, yearly. I think there was one year that they skipped since I have done the project, but they do this every single year. They're doing a wonderful job. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them in their work. Um, this is on sexual abuse. It's on emotional abuse, religious abuse, physical abuse. You know, and this is a three-day workshop. Uh, it is very much uh, sponsored. So they they have a full scholarship for those who generally who apply. The next set, so Peaceful Families Project is is one. Uh, the other one here in New Jersey is actually Cornerstone. Uh, Cornerstone, they offer similar programs and uh, they're they're paid. Uh, this one is on a scholarship, but they offer paid programs and they can be subsidized if you have multiple imams involved in that. So instead of paying, you know, I, I believe it's a, a couple thousand dollars for the programs that they have for each of the individual trainings that they give. So, but it's for groups. So, you know, if it's like $2,000 and you get like three, four imams involved then each community is paying or subsidizing that, then obviously it becomes a very reasonable cost. And now you have empowered your imam with something uh, that is very important. This is something I believe is unique to Hackensack Meridian. Uh, this is called the end of life consultancy. It's basically how to deal with people who are in hospice. So people who are uh, on their deathbeds, how to console them, how to deal with them. What are certain techniques? What are some things that are, are good to talk about to help them pass their time? Uh, again, something that I found very valuable, something that was really beneficial for me. This was offered for free. Uh, so this was a free program that was offered here at Hackensack Meridian ne nearby. It wasn't something that was far away. Uh, again, something that I would definitely uh, recommend. Uh, also, educational workshops, if, if they're available. Now, this one was for, for free when I was in Saudi This was offered by Hewitt Mifflin. It's basically a, a workshop on teaching methods and techniques. It's something that was very valuable to me. I believe this workshop was very short. It was only like a couple hours or so. But if you have an opportunity to attend uh, teaching workshops, again, something that I believe is very important, something that's very fundamental uh, to the imam's uh, arsenal. Uh, and these are things that I would definitely recommend everybody take part in uh, if you can. Uh, something very short. It's a great way for him to complement what it is that he's already doing. Uh, if you know of any other programs, please, you know, share them in the comments. I, I would love to uh, expand my own, you know, again, my own arsenal, uh, complement my own services uh, with anything that's available out there. If you know of anything, you know, go ahead, put them in the comments. I would love to read them. I would love to take a look at them, inshallah. Um, which brings us to the last role. And I, I know I messed up the roles this time, and I had always been stressing the importance of social, civil, and then ritual. But um, unfortunately, I, I forgot to change the order when I, I put this video together. So which brings us to the last one, regardless. Uh, which is the civil role. Uh, there are a number of citizens academies that are offered by the police forces. So you have on the local level, sometimes you'll have like a local citizens academy. 
Uh, the ones that are offered here in Woodbridge and here in New Jersey, they're a little bit longer. I, be, I believe they go for like a couple of weeks. So, I, and I understand that's more of a time commitment. Uh, the New Jersey State Police actually just started offering a uh, Citizens Academy. This is something that I had taken part in last year, or well, the year before. And we were part of the first graduating class. And this is this make basically uh, gives you information on what services the New Jersey State Police offers. It's a great way of developing a relationship with them so that when they come to your masjid, it is not the first time that they're coming. Or because you have a good relationship with them beforehand it's it's not the uh, it's not a reactionary relationship it is a proactive relationship if anything happens within the community that the state police is involved in they will have a contact point through you as the imam and again i think this is something very fundamental something that's very important a completely free program uh, this is something that was eight weeks they would give us dinner and coffee every week uh, it was once a week for i believe about three hours on a wednesday evening but a wonderful program, uh, something I highly recommend. I, I really had a good time uh, with this program. And uh, the last one that I will share with and I will talk about, and no, I'm not an agent because of this, but this is the FBI uh, Citizens Training Program. Every state has one. Again, something I would recommend, that very similar to what the New Jersey State Police did in terms of telling us and informing us what services the FBI offers, what services the FBI performs. Uh, highly recommend it. I uh, had a great time. They had uh, the uh, Citizens Academy that had graduated from these who would sponsor, again, dinner every week, uh, something that you know I'm, I'm very thankful for. Uh, there were a few Muslims who actually sit on that council, so they tried to make sure that they tried to pr provide halal options as often as possible. So, um, again, something I would recommend, something that is good, something, again, completely free. Um, and, um, you know, I, I had a good time with this. The last one is sometimes you will have uh, chaplain's trainings or interfaith type trainings. Uh, these are things that you can reach out to with your local government. You can le reach out to your local schools uh, and local law enforcement. These are great conduits in dealing with all of those different agencies. I would definitely encourage everyone to type, type uh, take advantage of that. Uh, many times mayors have different committees that an individual can participate in or he can volunteer for. If there is a council that you are passionate about or there is a committee that you are passionate about. And again, I think that's very important because it's a volunteer thing and you will be spending extra time. If you're passionate about a certain thing, if you're passionate about the environment or you're passionate about, you know, the roads, the road structure and signage and making sure the roads are clean, whatever the situation might be, there are different usually committees, committees for those. I would suggest participating in those because it allows you to meet the mayor and it helps you become uh, politically involved to an extent where you're actually helping the the local community and people will definitely see that and people will definitely recognize that but these are some of the trainings and these are some of the things that i have been able to take advantage of again things that are very much available and i recommend them for everyone uh, i ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless you all i look forward to seeing you all next time